And uh, it's the second, so we are still concerned about uh, cinema. Uh, yesterday I tried to give you kind of an introduction with a few clips and mentioning a number of, of films. And today the topic is, as you have seen on the sheet you received, Lubitsch meets Sully being Jewish in Berlin. Now, if in 1923 or 1925 or 32, uh, you would meet uh, someone who would say, well, I just met uh, Sally on the street in a coffee house, then the other person would know that definitely Sally is a Jewish male uh, living in Berlin. Sally has a connotation. And, uh, of course, the original the name is Salomon, Shlomo. And certain names are indicators in Weimar culture, be it in literature, uh, be it in, in public entertainment, and in theater, and cabaret, and in film. So if a certain character has a certain name, it's a time. I'm talking about Weimar cinema. Everybody knew, uh, or could know, that the character is uh, Jewish. Ernst Lubitsch played on this very often. He has many, many films where he is called Sally, uh, or other names with an um, obvious Jewish uh, connotation. Um, let's first take a look at... Uh, I promised yesterday that I called Lubitsch and uh, instead of answering, he sent me an image with him in the bathtub and uh, using a phone. I wanted to show this image by Lubitsch, but it didn't work. Of, of course, old material, and it uh, doesn't always look. So this is our second uh, topic today. And here... You have a few photographies by Lou, which is not a very young one. It's already done at the time when he had become famous and in Hollywood then had director his uh, Ernst Lubitsch. Uh, here below you see him also in Hollywood with Marlene Dietrich. And <coughs> always, not always, but almost always with a cigar in his hand. This kind of his his uh, logo, his mark. And <clears throat> he was born in Berlin in 1892. And he died in Hollywood after the war in 47. Now, referring to the talk you will uh, hear by my colleague uh, Mark and uh, with reference to the talk you heard uh, yesterday in the morning, um, was Ernst Lubitsch now an e or student, Easter Jew, or was he a Western Jew? Well, the answer is rather simple. He was a Berlin Jew. Um, meaning, he, of course, is definitely a German Jew, by all means. His father, not at all. His father hardly knew how to talk German, although he was very, very successful in textile business. Uh, the family were in Schönhauser Allee. I don't know whether the bus took you there also. It's Berlin Mitte. It's close to the Scheunenviertel, where we will be to, tonight. And uh, they had a very well-running textile business where rather wealth, the rather wealthy family lived in Schönhauser Allee and other places. And um, the child, of course, was sent to a gymnasium, one of the best in this part of Berlin Sophien Gymnasium, named after the Empress, the former German. And uh, on his way to, to school, the, 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 the school still exists, also the street, Sophienstraße, uh, he always had to pass parts of the Scheunenviertel. And so this atmosphere there and the explicit German Jewish ex uh, atmosphere, the milieu he grew up in. German Jewish businessmen or intellectuals or, or artists uh, is very significant for him because he could freely move between. But more important for his development was the fact that his father wanted him to uh, continue the textile business 
and work. He did it for one year, then almost disappeared because every evening he was studying to become an actor. He started to work as an actor in theaters in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, he started to, to act in small movies, one act in movies that are not existing anymore. And uh, then he really studied acting and he worked with Max Reinhardt, uh, already yesterday mentioned. If you mention the name Max Reinhardt in the context of German culture before World War I, during and during the Weimar period and during exile, uh, the most important figure in terms of theater is uh, Max Reinhardt. You can, in a certain way, you can compare to Stanislavski. Yeah, if you look for an outstanding uh, figure in the theater and uh, other cultures. When we talk about uh, filmmakers and who would be the most important filmmaker of Weimar cinema who survived 33 and went into exile, I couldn't name one. There are many. Uh, and if you ask, okay, what is the high tide, uh, the golden era of Hollywood film, uh, the 19, late 30s, 40s, 50s, early 60s, then you would have to name the same filmmakers as you would name concerning Weimar cinema. And this is very important. It's the uh, brave academics call it cultural transfer. I wouldn't call it this because it was due to national socialism uh, and racism and anti-Semitism. <coughs> so this is not cultural transfer, but something else. Now, Lubitsch became one of the most important uh, Hollywood directors. Uh, I mean, I assume that there's nobody in this room who hasn't seen Ninochka. Who hasn't seen Ninochka? Okay, this weekend, you, uh, you can find it on the internet uh, or wherever. Um, it's a wonderful film with Greta Garbo. And who has seen To Be or Not To Be? I mean, not the original play, but the film by Lubitsch. Not so much. This is a satire on, yeah, there, on uh, the Nazis occupying Poland, or not yet occupying Poland, also comedy. Both films are Hollywood films. And Lubitsch did not, uh, is not a refugee who just could get away from Germany because Hitler didn't like his films. Uh, Lubitsch went to Hollywood in the about 23, 24, very early, because he realized his chances of making good films were much bigger in Hollywood than in uh, Berlin. And there were also other filmmakers like Otto Preminger uh, or Michael Curtis, the director of Casablanca, who was one of the most important directors in Vienna in the early 20s. Uh, he produced monumental pictures and Hollywood wanted him there because the pictures he produced in uh, Vienna were much better than the monumental pictures produced in uh, Hollywood. So there are a number of filmmakers and actors, actresses who went before the Nazis, but at the end they did never return because of the Nazis and they made their lives, their career in Hollywood or in London or some of them in Moscow and uh, Palestine uh, and, uh, well, it's almost, that is, there was even one filmmaker in Shanghai. So uh, exile was something that spread um, cinematic know-how uh, worldwide. <clears throat> so the early uh, Lubitsch, the Prince Sami on the left, um, this is Ernst Lubitsch. Wonderful mask. And um, this film has not survived. We just have a few stills. This, in fact, is the only one I know with Ernst Lubitsch. Then the next one is uh, Blues King. Blaus King, not Blues. <laughs> um, the Blusenkönig. Um, he's a young apprentice in a textile store, uh, blouses, and makes his career. Um, and tries not to get married to the daughter of the boss. And the boss doesn't like him very much, but sees he is very efficient and very good for business. So he makes him his partner, 
uh, but um, he is obliged not to marry the daughter. Uh, he is very happy that he doesn't have to marry the daughter because there are about 20, 25 young women working at this place. So these films have everything that's politically not correct today. They are to a certain extent sexist, but they are also queer. There some of them are also feminists. One has to be very careful. Uh, we can't see all these films. We see a little bit later, and we see to, tonight also. So in the Blusenkönig, uh, this was where I found the one uh, sequence where he is sitting in a bar stool where there's foam all around him. Uh, the telephone is ringing, and he through the curtain he grabs the phone, and then he sits grinning and smiling in the water and is talking to the young lady who wants to marry him. And she tells him that her father doesn't allow her uh, to marry him. And uh, he's extremely happy. But what he's saying is, of course, he's extremely sorry. So you have this contradiction what he is saying. And you can read in the intertitle. And in fact, uh, his expression is um, just jealous. Um, Maya was Berlin is one of his best uh, films, was a huge success, full length already. And afterwards, we will uh, see uh, a longer uh, part from this film. Let's see, it's not on the market, so I have an archival copy. And it's kind of a little problem for the computers to read this old uh, DVD material. So we'll see it afterwards. I have to switch a little bit. But um, you have to wait for Maya aus Berlin. So again, here the name is essential, like Sally. Uh, seeing film of the Weimar period, you have to know how to decipher, how to decode, and uh, to understand what's behind the term, a word, an image, a gesture. This is very important also to see what is Jewish here, what is not Jewish, what is in between, what is making fun of being Jewish, what is making fun of being non-Jewish, what is making fun of the in-between. You know, there are many, many um, you know, layers. You know, the Weimar cinema, it's like a, an American sandwich. You have six layers. Uh, and if you are happy and hungry, you eat six layers. But sometimes you only eat one or two meaning you only realize, see, watch, understand one or two layers of these many-layered uh, movies. So here we have Maya aus Berlin. If, uh, let's say, in 1923, uh, I would meet somebody on a train, and he would say, uh, hello, my name is uh, Maya, I'm from Berlin, I would ask, was an E and a Y or an A and an I? And then he would say, I'm Maya from Berlin, so it's E. And why? And I would say, hi, how are you? Shalom. Uh, because then I would know he's Jewish. Now, with an A and an I, I would know he's not Jewish. Now, this says later on, this has been changed a little bit. But in this period, you could definitely say, and if somebody is saying, Maya from Berlin, and in the film at a certain point, he says, I'm Maya from Schöneberg, not Berlin. Schöneberg is a district, we heard it where are many, many Jews, also bourgeois Jews, were, were living in the interwar uh, period. So its names, its geography. Names and geography tell you something about uh, milieu. So it's definitely not schmulig from Posen. Uh, definitely not. Uh, you, you get clear sing signals in, in these years about German Jewish and Jewish from other parts of this uh, continent. So, OK, um, I was looking for posters. I mean, in the background, you always says Lubitsch. Uh, on the top on the left, it's uh, a short crimi story. Um, the case, Rosentop. Top. Then you have here Ossi Oswaldo. We will see her to, uh, today, uh, the, girl, the girl from the ballet. And uh, you, you have to realize that these posters were hanging all over. It's not just in the movie theater. So they were all over the, the city. And then Paula Negri, the second famous actress he worked with, Die Bergkatze, uh, The Mountain Lion, we will see afterwards uh, 
uh, some scenes from this film and um, the the director director is Lubitsch. Uh, the director here is also Lubitsch. Here is he is the also director. So the the films I show, uh, have shown you before, he was acting also. And from acting in films, in very short and longer films, you realized that the directors didn't know how to direct. He came from Reinhardt, you know, but the directors came from nowhere very often. Uh, so he realized that uh, directing, good directing, creative, innovative, modern directing is more important because the director can form the actors. Uh, he can he is one who has the, the power, the knowledge, and if he's good, also the creativity to form actresses and actors the way it should be. And this he had learned uh, with Max Reinhardt on theater. Um, then also um, the mountain um, lion here. You see the poster already. It's not just this realism. Uh, it's more. It gives its kind of expressionless a little bit. It looks much, uh, it looks modern. It has a connotation with a cat, you know, cat, female, you know, in literature, in painting, in art. Uh, there's always a relation, cats uh, expressing sexuality. You know. So you, you have the whole iconography of the visual arts, now also in posters and, of course, uh, in the films. And I wanted to indicate that Lubitsch was not just the director of Jewish topics. He became one of the most important directors in terms of visual modernism on the screen. What he did is, is, is amazing. And some of his, his films at the time were not so openly funny and slapstick, weren't accepted by the audience. Today we believe there are classics, you know, but back then it was much too modern or too progressive or People were not accustomed to see something like this. Because he, was, he is the uh, director who came from theater, who used theater in his early films. Yesterday I also mentioned, look, it's like a theater performance. And then he moved on. He said, no, movies, cinema, it's not staging in terms of theater. It is to visualize, to visualize something we can do on the stage. We'll see it later, what he was intending. OK, <clears throat> then uh, more and more uh, he turned to topics that were highly problematic in bourgeois society. He turned to queer cinema. He was a director of women in very powerful roles, very often with males who, so to say, are feminine, are rather weak, are passive. and. Uh, this is in, in many films the case, and very strong uh, women, young women in particular, in particular, who decided what they wanted to do and looked into ways how to do it. So there are films where you sometimes believe, well, why is there a happy end? The whole film doesn't lead to a happy end, or for the audience, he's producing a happy end at the end. So uh, left again, there is a man a male, uh, I don't want to be a man, he can't find work, so cross-dressing. It's one of the 1990s, one of the first uh, mainstream films with cross-dressing, and the, the image here, of course, the censorship just went crazy. You know, two men kissing each other in the year 1919, unbelievable. We had just lost the war, now we lost the masculinity. Yeah, so you, you can, can give an interpretation. I could go, go on and on and on how he contributed to a new perspective of masculinity by giving different images and visualizations of femininity. Now, this really is, uh, later on, this would be called in Hollywood the Lubitsch touch, that he has other ways of depicting uh, gender and uh, roles as many other directors. Uh, so, in the middle, uh, again, the oyster princess, uh, of course, is a princess uh, at the court, and she only likes oyster 
and uh, the film makes fun of uh, wealth, of uh, stubbornness. And then, uh, again, I don't want to be a man with the uh, female, Ossi Oswalda, you saw her before, lying um, on a launch. Uh, and uh, here, it's really, um, what would you say? It's uh, playing to the homosexual and lesbian community uh, in Berlin with this poster. You know, as we heard already, there were, all, were always lesbian clubs or uh, gay clubs uh, in, in Berlin. Some of them open, some of them closed, some of them mixed. And there was a huge audience, so to say, you would say today, queer audience, or all the capital letters you can name uh, and you can add. Yeah, so nothing is new today. Yeah, in terms of cinema, uh, I must say back then there was much more. Yeah, you didn't, didn't have any sexual tendency, interest or orientation. You couldn't find uh, mainstream films. There were mainstream films about uh, sadomasochism, uh, everything. You know? So it's, uh, the problem is that m most of these films are lost. Only very few are preserved in archives, and particularly in the German and Austrian archives, it's obvious that the Nazis were not interested in this kind of gender, gendered modernism, and so a lot was destroyed. Here you see that uh, the oyster princess to the left, I hope it's also oyster princess in Russian, but it seems so. Uh, this was a very was a success also in Moscow and some, and St. Petersburg at the time, um, and was shown on and on and on and on, and uh, as you can see also in other cities there uh, in Jena, um, here again the major uh, movie theaters in Kurfürstendamm. Um, it was a success, not just in Germany and Austria, also in France and in other countries were interested in German uh, filmmaking. Yeah. So, what, uh, well, we go on now with, uh, was planned differently, but you will, we will see tonight these two films and um, I will give an introduction then to these two films, and you will see in the evening why the two, uh, two sequences or sequences we will be seeing now from two other films relate very much also to the films in the evening and how his whole, let's see, his corpus, his, his whole work um, in, in Germany, in, Ber in Berlin, centered around a number of topics that were either related to the existence, the lives, the society, the milieu of Jews in uh, Berlin, or it was related to visual modernism, to be innovative, to be creative, and to do something on the screen that hasn't, has not been done uh, so far before. Uh, of course, if I say in these films we have Jewish topics and characters who are uh, playing Jewish characters, that doesn't mean that these actors, actresses, or other people who worked with Lubitsch and other Jewish directors on the screen uh, were Jewish. Many of them were, of course, non-Jewish. This doesn't, didn't play. They were actors, actresses. And we had the example yesterday with Nathan the Wise, this fantastic actor who played Nathan the Wise, um, Werner Krauss uh, became a Nazi and played in the most horrible anti-Semitic movies after 33. So, if, let's say, if we would have another three lectures, I would show you what happened to all the film people in Nazi Germany or when they had to, to leave and or were deported and murdered. You know, so, but this is another chapter. You know, but one has to keep it in mind, I think. So important.
So now you think, well, this is a traditional, uh, what we know already. You know, and it isn't very pleasant how he's behaving. And the next sequence is this whole masculinity breaks down. You know, because she wants to climb up the mountain, and of course, a Jew from Berlin climbing a mountain, this doesn't work. You know, so uh, the, the film lifts you in one scene, you think, okay, why? This is very traditional. And the next scene, then it's deconstructed, it's destructed. And this is the way uh, many of his films live, and how he also creates a comic situation. And you don't need much dialogue, as you could say. For this time, it's obvious. In the uh, two films we'll, we'll see tonight, uh, things will be, will be different. One is from 1916 and one is from 1919. Uh, the shorter film from 19 is already very much an avant-garde film for the time where many, many, many filmmakers till today just use this film as kind of a supermarket of ideas. And uh, the other film is the, I would say, the most classical Jewish feature film produced by Lubitsch, Schuppelis, Pinkus. Pinkus, again, uh, immediately can be decoded as a Jewish name. So if you see a film from Berlin, Schuppelis, Pinkus, you know, okay, it's a story playing in, a, in the Jewish milieu. Mm -hmm. 